This is the second video in a series where I explore what consciousness is and why it's so difficult to define. If you haven't seen the first part, it sets the stage by asking a question. What is consciousness? And why do even our best definitions fall short? Today we go deeper. We'll ask a more personal question, one that no model has fully answered, what it is like to be. And next time I'll be sharing a more grounded story about my grandmother's stroke and what it revealed about the mind when it begins to fade. There is a photo I keep returning to. A cow stands alone, ankle deep in the ocean, facing the horizon. It's not grazing, not walking, just standing still, looking. Something about it stays with me. Not because I think the cow is like us, but because I suspect it is not. And still I wonder what it is like to be that cow in that moment. This question, what it is like, is at the heart of today's video. Because when we talk about consciousness, it's easy to focus on behavior, on brain scans, on inputs and outputs, but those don't tell us what it feels like to be. Let's start with the basics. Most scientific theories of consciousness focus on function. They look at attention, perception, decision-making. Consciousness is treated as something the brain does. And for many problems, that works. It explains behavior, it predicts reactions, but something essential is missing. In 1974, philosopher Thomas Nagel wrote a paper with a now famous title, What it is like to be a bat. Bats navigate by sonar. Their perception of the world is extremely alien to ours. We can study their brains, model their reactions, track their behaviors, but we still wouldn't know what their experience feels like. We just can't step inside. Nagel's point wasn't about bats, really. It was about the limits of objectivity. There is something it is like to be a conscious creature, and that something is missing from purely functional accounts. Philosophers call this first-person layer of experience qualia. The redness of red, the itch of a mosquito bite, a feeling of awe oh, when you watch the sky change color. But these are not things we observe in others, there are things we live through from the inside, and they are not captured in brain scans, no matter how detailed. You could know everything about how vision works and still not know what red looks like until you've seen it. You could know everything about someone's behavior and still not know what it feels like to be them. This brings us to a deeper issue, the problem of other minds. You can't access my experience directly and I can't access yours. With humans, we assume consciousness, because we look alike, talk alike. But with animals, the question gets harder. They don't speak, they don't report, but that doesn't mean they don't feel. When a bat curls upside down in a cave, or when a cow gazes at the sea, we don't know what it's like to be them. But does it mean that there is nothing there? Or are we just not equipped to see it? One philosophical method that takes experience seriously is phenomenology. Not a theory, but a practice of describing consciousness as it appears. Founded by Edmund Husserl, phenomenology begins with a basic move called epochy. This means suspending assumptions about objects, about the world, even about the brain, and instead attending to how things show up in experience. Don't ask, what is a tree? Ask, how does this tree appear to me right now? In this light, from this distance, with this feeling attached. Phenomenology also works with the key idea called intentionality, the idea that consciousness is always about something. You never just feel, you feel toward. Toward a thought, a memory, a sound, a fear, a hope. A phenomenologist might ask, how does boredom feel in my body? How does time pass differently in anxiety versus calm? What is the structure of a moment of clarity? And crucially, phenomenology favors description over explanation. Instead of saying fear activates the amygdala, it describes fear as a closing of space, tightening in the chest, a sense of being pushed inward by the world. This is not about dramatizing experience. It's about noticing its shape with rigor and care. Phenomenology doesn't solve the hard problem, but it gives us language and discipline to work with what it's like without reducing it. Let's land this clearly. 
There is a physical processing, brain states, behavior, reflexes, but there is also something else. Call it qualia or subjective experience. It's not explained by the physical, but it appears to be a necessary condition of consciousness. It is poorly understood, mostly unmeasurable, especially in non-human minds. But that doesn't make it any less real. We must not reduce it, and we must not assume that only beings similar to us possess it. To be conscious is not just to behave, it is to experience, and that changes everything. If you found this helpful or even slightly disorienting, I would love if you subscribed. This channel is an ongoing inquiry. One part science, one part philosophy, and one part reflection. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. And stay tuned for the next video. What a stroke taught me about consciousness.